welcome to Arcade 2021. I am Tendai Huchu, and I'll be doing a panel on African crime fiction with Angela Makolwa, Mukuka Chipanta, and Femi Kayode. For the first question, I would like to ask our novelists about their novels. Femi, could you kick us off and then Angela? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, thank you, thank you. Um, thanks, Tendai. Um, such a privilege to be on this panel with such great writers and I wanted to take umbrage with the idea of crime wave but I guess that's what we are right we write crime <laughs> and and um, my story uh, Light Seekers is really I would say it's a social crime novel it is following the investigation into the the mob violence against three undergraduates in a university town. And my protagonist, uh, Dr. Philip Taiwo, is an investigative psychologist who was brought on to find out why this crime happened, why a whole community would turn on three undergraduates that, uh, you know, that's lived with them, lived in the same community for so long. And so the whole story just sort of looks at the social, the psychological, the the many factors and many issues that would have contributed to this community being so violent against the students. And um, yeah, and I, I think that is really where the title Light Seekers comes from because light is considered to be a metaphor for knowledge and insights. And that was what my clinical or my investigative psychologist was looking out for to find insights into why this crime happened. Angela, you've got a slightly different take on the crime novel in that your novel has a bit of romance. It could be a a domestic drama. It's a very different approach from Femi's. So could you tell us a bit more about Critical But Stable and your approach to crime fiction? Yeah, thank you for having me on the panel. Um, so Critical But Stable is actually my fifth um, novel and my third foray into the world of crime fiction. Uh, as you rightly said, it's more of a of crime in a domestic setting, which can be much more, um, I don't know, thrilling, I think, for the reader because of that intimacy of um, the home environment, that when crime comes knocking home, there's something much more real and much more urgent about it. Um, so I really enjoyed um, setting it in, in these intimate environments. So just briefly, it's about a social club, which is quite common here in South Africa. We call them stockfells. So you have a savings club um, as couples or as individuals and you get together once a month and you contribute towards kind of an investment and you share uh, the dividends of um, the collection of money that you've made over time. So this book is about four couples um, that are part of the Kula society but and, and all of them have been in long-term relationships. So I also wanted to look at marriage and long-term relationships in general and how they are often in critical but stable conditions because of certain issues that arise. So each of the couples is dealing with a major issue in their marriage, but because they are in this um, social club, each one, when they present themselves to the group, they all want to seem as if they are in this blissful marriage because all of them are quite successful. So there's a lot of keeping up with the Joneses that goes on. But I think the opening chapter and the opening scene of the book is what actually kind of propels the reader to keep on reading because it starts with a young man who's looking down on the dead body of a woman who is in his apartment. And uh, as you read on, you realize that uh, he has an intimate relationship with this woman. And as you read on, you realize that, uh, you know, he's, he's admiring his body in the beginning and he's just speaking about how loving and how desirable this woman is, but then she's not alive. So why is she in his apartment? Why is she dead? Did he kill him? Did, did he kill her? And when he says, oh, what am I gonna tell the husband? Then we realize even more alarmingly that this woman is actually a married woman and this is clearly not her husband. So it's a murder mystery uh, in that sense. And, um, and so when we get to encounter the three couples, we wonder which of these three women uh, uh, in these marriages is the dead body and why did she stray from her marriage? Why did she have this affair with this man 
uh, has led her to end up dead, uh, which is obviously <laughs> not what she would have intended with whatever it is that she was doing with this man. So, yeah. Mukuka, you have a slightly different approach as well. Uh, you are working in the police procedural, which is um, sort of your bread and butter for crime fiction, but you're mixing this in with um, an element of Zambian history, so it could be a bit of historical fiction as well. Could you tell us about your approach? Yes, thank you. Thank you for, for having me. Yes, uh, my book is Five Nights Before the Summit, and uh, basically it's a it's a it's a story that starts pretty dramatically on a farm in the outskirts of the capital city Lusaka in Zambia. It starts with a home invasion. You've got um, a couple, white couple um, uh, that has been in the country um, since uh, before independence, and uh, this is uh, the time frame is about 15 years after independence in 1979. And um, this couple are invaded, ultimately brutally uh, murdered. The case starts, you have a, the Zambian police and an experienced police officer uh, is heading the, the case to solve the, the crime. But what complication is there at the time is that you have a, a summit that will be taking place in a few days. And this is uh, the, the first Commonwealth summit uh, that will be taking place on African soil, will be taking place in, in Zambia. And this is historically true. And um, so the pressure is on. The Queen of England will be, is, is supposed to officiate at this ceremony, really a uh, big thing for the country that has, is not too far removed from, from uh, independence from England. And so there's a lot of political pressure to actually solve this mystery and really bring the culprits to book ahead of the summit. I tried to weave in uh, a number of the things that were happening in the country at that time. So you've got these, these tensions that were still there, still brewing since independence uh, between, between the races. And also there's this whole notion of, of who controls the the resources of the country and that plays into the story basically that's 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 the gist of it femi i'm really interested to find out in your opinion what makes for a crime novel i that is a million dollar question <laughs> i do think that light seekers is a crime novel it's just not a procedural it's not a mystery as much as is what someone called a why done it it's not a who done it. It's a why done it. It's a twist on the genre uh, itself. I think, to be to be fair, I think what really makes uh, Light Seekers a crime fiction or a crime novel is because a crime is at the heart of it. You know, there, there's a crime. What is crime fiction? Crime fiction really is when we have a conflict that is driven by a, a crime or something that deviates from the normal, from the accepted norms, that's a crime. You know, so if a society has come together and decided that it is um, not right or it is morally or legally wrong for, say, ah, for you to, to fetch water from a well, uh, that's a crime, you know. Um, and if the process of solving that crime or explaining that crime is the basis for the novel, I think that is a crime fiction. So for me, I think the, 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 the definition of crime fiction is, is, is can be as, very, as specific as that. But because my sensibilities when it comes to literary work is, about, is that conflict itself is driven by some kind of crime, you know, uh, some kind of act against the, the either the heart or the sensibilities and things like that. And when you define conflict as desire versus danger, that danger to a desire is constantly, to my mind, defined within the context of a crime. So for me, I actually approach all literature like a crime, <laughs> solving a crime or understanding a crime. So um, that's, that, that's, I think that would be how I approach things. It's a very personal uh, thing for me that every story must have conflict at its heart and that, that conflict 
at one point or the other, either against the state or against the individual or against an institution, there's a crime at it, at the heart of it. You know, what's exciting to me about just the world of crime literature and even uh, from a cinematic point of view as well, is that with especially women moving into the space, um, the definitions are becoming a bit blurred. And, you know, you look at a, a, a book like Gone Girl. I mean, that is that is crime fiction, but it's also very uh, domesticated in its themes because it's, it's, there's this kind of underlying love story and there's this constant tension between this couple and we don't know, you know, is she missing or what's going on? Um, and I love, I love that when we lend ourselves to this world of crime fiction as women, we bring in this different dynamic. And so with Critical But Stable, it's not a who done it as such, it's a who got done. Because, <laughs> we, <laughs> yeah, we want to know who got dead here. Uh, because the, as, we, as we get to know the couples, the biggest thing that's looming, you know, in our heads is, okay, there's a one, one of these women must be the dead body that we encountered in the first chapter. So it is kind of a meta mystery with a twist. And, and there's even a bigger twist, as you would know, uh, Tendai, you know, uh, uh, towards the end of the book, because we actually find out what really happened in that room is not what we thought is, uh, uh, is, is what actually uh, transpired. So there's a lot of domestic crime elements, as you're saying. Um, there's a lot of suspense, I would say, and I think that's and, and that's kind of a trademark, I think, of my writing, because my first grounding into literature was in crime fiction, but that was like a hardcore gritty crime novel. It was about a serial killer and a journalist and, and um, you know, this, this serial killer had reached out to a female journalist to write his life story, life story because she'd been covering his case before he was incarcerated. Um, and this is actually based on my own real life experiences with a serial killer here in South Africa. Um, so that's where I started out. And uh, for me, the classic uh, ingredients, I would say, of what I would regard as a crime novel is a lot of suspense, a lot of cliffhangers. So you'll find that most of my writing has very short episodes because it's short and sharp and you wanna read on. So I always wanna create that, you know, lays crisps effect where you kind of keep on eating and eating and like thinking, okay, this is my last chip. And just as when you're thinking this is my last chip, you wanna eat again because it's so good. So that is that is kind of my, uh, uh, um, a recipe for what I would call a classic uh, uh, crime novel. Very interesting uh, because I uh, actually, when I set off to write the novel, I didn't set out to write a crime novel. The way it turned out, indeed, it is a crime novel, uh, but I wanted to focus more on the, the, the characters and, and more specifically uh, the story of Max, who is the um, the the lead um, investigator, and uh, looking at his lens and looking at what was happening in the country as a whole. In in my view, a, a crime novel is uh, what the others have said here. Uh, you know, who done it, or why done it, who got done. <laughs> but my novel, I think, yes, it turned out to be. Um, in, in one sense, the archetypal crime novel of uh, a, a crime is committed, it's being investigated, and you're trying to determine uh, who did it and why. But I really wanted to bring in that political component, basically trying to, to get into the, to the head of the lead investigator and all of the things that were happening in the country, uh, some things preventing him from, from really carrying out uh, his duties, how he is um, a stickler for detail, a stickler for process, but he, he's being pulled in different directions based on all of these uh, political interests. So um, my thought on, on, on crime novels. I've sort of noticed uh, something about how a lot of African crime writers tend to also work in, in other genres. If you think about Tade Thompson's uh, Making Wolf, which won a catchy and is ostensibly sci-fi, but really functions as a noir novel. Or you think about authors like uh, 
Okayin Braithwaite, uh, who is my sister, Serial Killer, um, is a treat for genre crime readers, but was also um, shortlisted for, for the book as, as a literary novel. So they, they tend to be this um, genre blending going on. Um, Mukuka, you started off uh, with The Casualty of Power, which is uh, a straight up literary novel. And but your second novel is is this wonderful police procedural. So could you say something about that, this fluidity and this movement between genres? Yes, very interesting. And the two novels are definitely two different genres. For me, that flexibility comes in uh, by really seeking seeking to get into the heads of the characters. I think my my work, if I were to describe it, is very character driven. In the first instance, I really uh, concentrated on you know a couple of main characters over this issue of the Chinese in 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 Zambia um, and Africa in general, and kind of those tensions that were happening at the time. In the second novel, the Five Nights Before the Summit. Again, as I mentioned before, I, I I really wanted to get into the head of the that lead investigator, and then bring in all of these other tensions that were taking place at the time. Really trying to uh, weave in actual history, as I did actually in the first novel as well, uh, weave in some actual events, and then. Um, really blur the lines between what is fiction and and what is um, actual history. So um, that that was my thought process, and and I think that led me unknowingly into the genre of of, of crime fiction. Angela, you started out as a journalist, and and I believe at at one point you did a series of interviews with a serial killer in in South Africa with a view to doing a non-fiction book. Um, but I've also noticed in your catalog, you've got books that are, are chiclet, uh, and but you also work in, in genre crime. So perhaps you could tell us a bit more about your career and what makes you move through these different genres. Yeah, because I just, I write what I like. I like, I write what I like to read. Um, so my collection of literature, it's split mainly between those two genres. Of course, I read historical fiction. I read literature, uh, hardcore literature. But when I'm relaxing and I want to, you know, switch off from the world, those are the worlds that I escape into. And I guess that must have influenced um, what are the kind of subject matter that I'm drawn to. But my debut novel was a happy accident because it was supposed to be a biography on Moses Sitole, as I, I initially alluded uh, to. Uh, so he's someone that, as a crime as a crime reporter, I was covering. He had he had this murderous spree, and he was targeting women like myself, young black women, um, in the townships of South Africa. So. For me, I guess what drew me to the story is I don't like to feel, you know, endangered. And when how I conquer my fears is to directly confront them. So I, I was drawn to the Moses Sitole story as a journalist at that time. Um, and I covered it until he, he was sentenced. But then I wanted more. I wanted to actually sit down with him and, and find out the psychology be, behind his crimes, why why he targeted women specifically, and what is it that would drive somebody to be that sick, I suppose, because he not only he not only killed them, he would rape them and kill them. And I didn't know that that's something, and he was the first serial killer case here in South Africa, and it was just post our democracy. And I think at that time we thought this is not something that is African as well. It's not, it's not an African, this, this, idea of serial homicide is not an African thing, or at least that's what we thought back then. Um, so there was a lot about it that disturbed me as a, a reporter and as a woman. So I think uh, the accident happened because it, it was a biography, but he's a psychopath and he allowed me into his world. He allowed me to come and visit him at the maximum security prison where he was held. And 
there was kind of a relationship that develops between you know the subject and um, the writer. But he then started having this unhealthy view of what was happening between us. And because of that, I had to drop the project. So for me, that was the end of that chapter. And I never thought I would become a novelist because I always saw myself as uh, a reporter of factual events. Um, so it was only when I had an encounter with a publisher and I had we were just, I think at some cocktail party or something, and we had a discussion about this. And he said to me, this is an amazing story. Maybe you should fictionalize it. And it had never occurred to me to do that. I had just thought I had wasted about six months of my life going to see this man in prison. So that's how I actually got into, into writing. And it happened to be crime writing, which uh, coincidentally is the kind of genre that I enjoy as a reader. Um, and so from there, I really needed something lighter because what I had to do by fictionalizing my encounters with this very dangerous person is to really put myself in the story so that it's enjoyable for the reader. And what I also had to do is to come up with the most ex extreme uh, scenarios of what may have occurred as a result of me bringing this person into my world. So that it's interesting, it's, it's gripping, it's, you know, it's like your worst nightmare, what would happen in your worst nightmare. So those are the kind of scenarios I had to bring out in the book in, in Red Ink, which is um, the debut novel that I'm referring to. And so after that, I just felt, so my publishers, because it was quite popular, I did really well here in South Africa. Um, so my publishers wanted me to write something else. And I said to them, I can't go into that dark world again. Um, and so I, I, I was turning 30 at the time. And I just thought, you know what, let me write about relationships and turning 30 and all the drama that happens there. Um, and, it was, and, I, and it was kind of cathartic for me um, to, to have those experiences uh, writing experiences kind of dovetail each other. It was kind of a relief from the darkness of Red Ink. That's fantastic, which sort of brings me to a question that I'm fascinated about, which is writers and their influences, uh, just trying to gauge, you know, what influences them in their craft. Uh, Femi, thinking about your character, Philip K. Taiwo, um, is this a reference to Philip K. Dick? Uh, because I, I don't know, I, when I was in the university, there was a friend of mine whose name was Philip Taiwo. And I always just liked the way it flows. Like, <laughs> Philip Taiwo, that's so cool. You know, uh, so I always still say that I was going to use it in a book. Uh, yeah, but my, my background is um, from the sciences. I studied um, um, animal science. Then I went back to the university to do clinical psychology. Uh, I did a lot of stage work and a lot of TV work. But uh, my influences are, are very eclectic. I'm not your typical literary, I don't have a literary background, so to speak. And I, I, I bulk at categories, I bulk at, at um, classifications and genres and things like that. So it really is, my background is reading a lot of crime stories, uh, reading a lot of literature. I loved Toni Morrison. My favorite writer for a very long time was a guy called, um, I think, um, William Styron. I really, really loved William Styron. And I loved uh, the, the crime fiction, the Sidney Sheldon's uh, and uh, the James Hadley Chase. So I, I, mixed, I mixed and matched. Uh, my background affecting my writing really, really is, I think I can't divorce it because Light Seekers was written with part of my master's thesis at the University of East Anglia in crime fiction. So I had no choice but to write a crime novel. I, I really deliberately didn't want to approach it based on that genre. I really just wanted to tell a true and authentic story that just happened to have a crime at the heart of it. So I don't know, maybe that answers your question in terms of my background and what I bring to the table. Also, Light Seekers was based on, loosely based on something that occurred in Nigeria, I think in 2012, when four undergraduates in a, a university uh, town were, were lynched by a mob. And it, it just sort of like reverb braided all over the world like how could people do this you know and they were called the alu four and i really wanted i actually wanted to write a, a a true crime 
novel, like uh, in cold blood, like Truman Capote. But I couldn't, uh, for many reasons, rights uh, uh, and so many other things, because I was studying in the UK and I was going to write the story about something that happened in Nigeria. And there were just so many logistical issues. So I went into, just like Angela did, I sort of went into the space where I had to imagine the worst case scenario. I had to put characters in the worst, the darkest possible place for me to be able to tell the kind of story that I wanted to tell. But I really feel that I'm the kind of writer that my own experience that I don't know, I, I, I like the idea of writing a story because I want to know what happened. Uh, so I don't have the answers when I start out. I, I I sort of know the plots, but I don't know the answers. So it's very I'm very character driven, and I tend to give my characters a bit of a free reign to work with the plots that I have in my head. You know, what would they do in this kind of situation, kind of thing. So those are the kind of I think that would be my influences in a sense. You know, I'm trained in creative writing. I'm doing my PhD in creative writing. Um, so it's it's I, I write I write to the specifications of what I want to say, like you said, form. That's really uh, interesting and and fascinating, Femi. And you know, we've talked about your creative writing course and the fact that uh, you also have Toni Morrison as as one of your influences. But I'm really interested in in African crime, do you have any sort of influences who work within sort of like the genre from the continent? I totally love Leia Denley, who, who wrote quite some very, very interesting books uh, based on Lagos. Uh, so you should check him out. I love Oyinkan, uh, my sister, the serial killer. Uh, I can't see whether they were influences per se, but I remember when I was growing up, there was a series by Macmillan called the setter series that I was totally addicted to. And like I said, a lot of people say they were not crime fiction or whatever, but they really were based on really contemporary conflict-driven stories. Um, and I really, really, really liked them. Pace setters really had an influence on me when I was growing up. Uh, I really wanted to write like those story, uh, writers. And, and, and I think there was a, there was a writer too, uh, Omoto Shaw, a doctor Omoto Shaw, I think it's Femi Omoto Shaw, who wrote a very beautiful, beautiful spy story, crime story when I was growing up. And I actually, I think on record, it's recorded as um, West Africa's first crime novel. So, yeah, so I really like that. I think those are the influences I have. But typically, I don't know why crime fiction as a genre is not as popular as it should be. That I personally think that crime fiction as a genre, is maybe one of the most powerful, contemporary, popular medium to tell our stories, to tell our contemporary stories, because crime affects everyone. Crime is one of those genres that, you know, permeates every part of the community, irrespective of race, age, gender, or whatever. So it was very, very, I've always found it very, very uh, fascinating that crime stories does not have as much impact, or we don't have more crime writers as we should because it, it really is the most powerful form of literary medium for me that is contemporary that appeals to everybody across board and you mkoka are there any influences on the zambian side is there sort of any zambian crime fiction that might have helped you in your formative years yes i love uh crime stories period i do love lay denley as uh, as femi pointed out Beautiful, beautiful novels that are that I've read and enjoyed. I like a, a, a Quay Quatere in uh, in Ghana, the the Darko series. Michael Stanley uh, comes into mind. And that's the, the the two authors that write the Kabu series. I, I, it is surprising to me as well that uh, you don't have as many as we should, considering the the vastness of the African continent. Um, we don't have that many African authors writing crime novels. I, I would say in, in, in Zambia, again, not too many that I know of that are dabbling in that sphere. Um, uh, many of them um, really try to touch on just 
uh, literary fiction in general, but um, not specifically uh, the genre of crime. Um, so it's, it's an area I'd, I'd really love to see uh, flourish um, more. Uh, uh, but I, yes, I, I've had uh, many of those influ influences from from across Africa, and uh, yeah, I, it's I, I think we should do more. Should do more for sure. Let's think a bit about the journey to to publication. I, I know uh, Mukoka, your novel was published by Weaver Press uh, in, in Zimbabwe, who are sort of mainly into literary novels, although not not exclusively. Uh, but I just want to talk about the opportunities for getting published within genre crime. Angela, um, thinking about the South African scene, I know Red Ink was a really popular uh, debut novel when it first came out, and you've got fantastic crime writers in South Africa like uh, Dion Mayer. But could you tell us a bit about sort of like the path to publication and what the options are for getting published within the genre um, in, in South Africa and maybe thinking about the continent as a whole? Um, my publisher is Penn Macmillan and they've got quite an appetite for commercial fiction in general, as long as it's good fiction. Um, and yes, crime fiction, certainly. Um, Dion Mayer, as you correctly say, is very popular and he does very well um, in this market and overseas. Uh, I think he's published by, oh my goodness, I'm not, I think he's published by Quella Books, if I'm not mistaken. So there is an appetite for, for African-based stories, African-based commercial fiction. Um, uh, the genre not, non -withstand, not withstanding the genre as long as it's African stories that uh, can travel um, you know that that are relatable across the world so yes I definitely think that there's opportunities there and one of my contemporaries that maybe you guys haven't heard of that I'd really love for you to check out if you can is a is a guy by the name of Sifiso Mzobe he wrote Young Blood an amazing amazing um uh, work of crime fiction, uh, also set here in Johannesburg. It's very gritty, it's very compelling, and uh, touches on a number of social issues as well, which I think is also um, a part of the DNA of African crime is that we we do tend to delve um, on, on social issues like Femi's book uh, about the mob justice. Um, my book also touches on, I mean, critical but stable, maybe a domestic crime story, but it even talks about issues like um, Afrophobia. I think you know obviously about South Africa and 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 some attitudes towards foreigners. So I bring that into into the story. So I think that's what makes African crime fiction so exciting and so rich because we do tend to go beyond. Um, just trying to titillate the, the reader with suspense and this and, and all these other elements of, of, of crime writing that we really um, take the time to actually talk about real social issues that affect us, uh, our societies. Femi, you went a slightly different route uh, because I, I remember you mentioning your creative writing program at UAE um, and um, this uh, UAE Curtis Brown Award that you won. Could you tell us a bit about your journey towards publication? Okay, the only thing I can say about my part of publication is that it was exceptionally intentional. I was, I was driven, I was intentional, and I, I reached out to the people and the sections and the and the communities that I knew were going to drive my 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 uh, ambition, so to speak. So I went back to school, for instance, to study creative writing because I knew I wanted to write a novel. So despite the fact that I'd written tons and tons of TV shows, I worked in advertising. I knew that I needed a community of writers to to help me realize my dream. So I went very late in life to do my my, my masters. Um, and then in that community, I was able to have tutors, mentors uh, that were able to guide my career and to give me an idea of the kind of agents that I was supposed to reach out to and the kind of people that would be interested in my work. And I was lucky to win the Little Brown, which is actually a competition that is actually open to all the creative writing students in crime fiction. So again, that that was a very good thing that I was able to then put on my um on my query letters to agents 
to send out and like winner of little brown you know <laughs> would like to talk to you kind of thing and i got responses on the basis of that so my my journey is is is, is a combination of luck um meets almost cold calculating intention you know uh because i really really knew that this was what i was going to go for i was very clear about the kind of agent that i wanted i wanted an agent that was going to um, look at my work not just from a nigerian fiction point of view but also from the kind of fiction that could that could be placed in a shelf place next to my literary heroes you know the david baldashis of this world and all that and i was very excited when i was also able to get publishers that were interested in it and the first question i would ask the publisher or i would ask the, even the agent then was uh, where do you see my book on the bookshelf you know, um, I just I just wrote an article for the Writers and Artists Yearbook, and it was actually titled Shelf Space. You know, I was very, 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 very intentional as to where I wanted my book to be in the shelf space. I didn't want to be African literary fiction. I didn't want to be, I, I, just, I just wanted to be contemporary and for lack of a better word, pop. You know, I wanted to appeal to a very large audience that would read it and say, this can ha only happen in Nigeria, but it was entertaining and, uh, and engaging enough for me to, to enjoy it, even if I was Russian or if I was from Iceland, you know. So I, I, I think it's a combination of my background in advertising and understanding target audience and all of that, and my own maybe journey as a writer to where I am now, you know, close to, uh, so then close to 50 and being very sure what I wanted to do and what I wanted to achieve. So that's my journey to publishing. It's it's not typical, you know, but uh, that's my journey. <laughs> I really like what you're saying there, Femi, about um, intentionality and how you achieve sort of, um, your your writing goals which is getting to publication a lot of the time we have these conversations people tend to be a bit wishy-washy and and make it out to be a mystical process but i would really like to talk to you guys about what is coming next um for you femi do we have another philip taiwo novel due out okay so um my contract my publishing contract is it's a two book deal uh i'm hoping it to be renewed again so it's based on a series so i'm actually required to write a philip taiwo sequel um and i'm very happy that i i finally put full stop to the first draft of book two uh a couple of weeks back um i'm very very it was a very difficult journey everything you've heard about i don't know what angela went through i don't know what uh Mukoka went through but god this idea of the second the difficult second novel is real <laughs> <laughs> it's real you know it, it's real it's real and a lot of people would say oh but it's um maybe it's self-inflicted in a sense uh like we are the ones that put the pressure on ourselves because nobody really expects it to be more difficult or whatever. We're the ones that want to be better than the first one. Uh, but I think the process of having, for me especially, having edited uh, um, Light Seekers, which some of, to my mind, some of the best editors, uh, you know, of, of their time in crime fiction, I learned so much that I was very eager to put into the second one. So I, I just finished um, the second book and it's called Gaslight. And um, Gaslight is, uh, is Philip Taiwo investigating why the why the wife of a mega pastor church or mega church pastor um, is is dead and why they are framing the mega pastor or why the mega pastor has been accused of her murder? So that's that's um, gaslight. These are guys are babies, Angela. You've done five novels you've been through the process of doing the third and the fourth and the fifth can you tell us about that 
Yes, I'm saying this is actually the fifth. Uh, critical but stable is the fifth. Uh, yes, there's a lot of pressure, especially somebody like me who doesn't necessarily box herself into one particular genre. So, for instance, a book, a book like The Blessed Girl, which Mukuka says he absolutely loved, um, <laughs> it's not crime fiction at all, uh, but it really got people excited, it traveled well, and people spoke about it for or they just kept going on and on about it. So that's the book that gave me the most pressure because then I wanted to segue back into my my crime, my criminal self. Um, and so I just felt that pressure of, you know, am I going to do as well? Will, will, will these new readers that I've managed to captivate with the Blessed Girl who are not necessarily crime um, enthusiasts uh, be interested in something that's got kind of a darker, uh, more suspenseful, you know, um, uh, element to it. So there's always pressure, I think, when I write, and, and we are our worst crit critics. And um, I'm, I'm still an insecure writer. Five uh, novels later. So, so yeah, it's. I think the pressure stays with you, and it's probably a healthy uh, pressure to lay on your shoulders because then it pushes you to obviously give your readers your your best um the best of you so so that's actually quite a good thing um what i'm working on at the moment i'm actually adapting uh red ink for the small screen so uh it's it's, it's been it's an interesting journey having to revisit um my my debut novel which is probably why i've been talking about it so much today because um, i'm rewriting it for the small screen um and there's been quite a lot of interest uh from various um entities that i won't name for now because it's also early days but but yeah it's it's it's, it's phenomenal because also noting the difference between writing a novel and writing for the screen whether it's the small screen or for tele i mean or the big screen um so i'm, I'm really enjoying the challenge of of, of of this experience that i'm going through right now wow that is so fascinating so we have this mad situation where um Angela, and, and I keep my fingers crossed for this project. Angela, you are moving into in, into film, and we have Femi, uh, on the other hand, who started out working in in the film industry and script writing and that sort of thing. So I offer my services to Angela. <laughs> my people will be calling your people. Yes. <laughs> All right, so Mukuka, uh, you have to to top all these big projects the others are doing. What are you working on next? <laughs> I, I fear I can't top uh, uh, these two distinguished writers here. Um, but what I can say is that uh, the, the the pressure of the second novel is 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 real. <laughs> I took a little bit of a break into a different direction with. Uh, Actually, I, I started a um, a podcast, so I was interested in audio stories. I I, I, I listened to them anyway, and then I had a, a bunch of uh, short stories that I've written, which didn't particularly have a home. And I started a, a podcast called uh, Kutika. Um, so it's it's you know it's we're in the second series, and and that's worked out well. So it's a little bit of a home for for some orphan stories of mine, if I can say. Um, but I've, I've had that itch, um, I've been, I've started to write a few things. I, I feel that uh, my detective uh, Max Chanda has has some more to say and I've, uh, some some ideas have been percolating in my mind and, and I've started to, to scratch some things and, and, and put them on paper. So so that's my, my, my next next big project, if you will. <laughs> but I was reading an article some time ago that was talking about African crime fiction and it, it was an interview actually and I can't quite recall by who um, and was talking about sort of like the characteristic of, of African crime fiction, what it shares with um, Western sort of like noir themes about alienation, quest for identity and, and, and things like that. But but this piece also say that there were certain um, differences and things unique to crime fiction to to African crime, which is a, a more overtly political uh, sensibility, 
uh, and it can be dark at times, but there was something that was described in there that that the darkness often morphs into into something like Afro pessimism. So, so I should ask uh, you, Femi, are you an Afro pessimist? I have no idea what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> I really, and I, and I'm not trying to be cheeky. I don't understand the idea, the idea of Afro pessimism and all of those things. But what I will say is that I think that post-colonial world, any kind of community that has been marginalized in the past has something that N.K. Jemisin calls the element X. And that is that there is something that, that, that changes the narrative of our stories. And we cannot tell stories for entertainment purposes. We cannot tell stories simply for enjoyment. We need to have something that is linked to it. It needs to be a bit more social and a bit more, um, a bit more um, profound in a sense. We, we don't have the luxury of entertainment for entertainment purposes. So for me, I call it, I, th I think it's actually a, a Zambian that coined the term post-colonial traumatic stress disorder. And I think that that affects everywhere, not just Africans, but also uh, what you can call the Native Americans. You can affect any kind of society or culture that has ever been under any kind of um, colonialism or, or have been, uh, there's a lot of marginal, I would say marginalized groups in a sense. Mm -hmm. But in terms of Afro-pessimism, because of time, I don't know how to, because I'm not pessimistic. I'm, I'm actually quite an optimistic person, you know? So I cannot even, I don't know what it means to be Afro, to be an Afro-pessimist. You know, um, crime occurs in London and crime occurs in Scotland and crime occurs in Africa or occurs in Lagos. I don't even want to call it Africa. And the way that I approach it is as a storyteller, not from because I'm pessimistic or not, but because I'm telling a story and I want it to be as compelling and as interesting as possible. That's it. Okay. Um, what about you, Angela? Are you an Afro-pessimist? Because things can get a bit bleak and critical but stable. <laughs> I consider myself the exact opposite of uh, an Afro-pessimist. And the reason I say that is that what I'm intentional about is my settings. Um, so place is very important to me in, 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 in storytelling. And the reason uh, place is, is important is because I'm very deliberate about telling the other side of the African story. So a lot of my books, uh, the characters are fairly affluent, if not quite affluent uh, in the case of uh, the characters in Critical But Stable. Um, you know, they may be in a dark place or they may have encounters with uh, the darker underbelly of society. Um, more often than not, most of my characters live kind of these glitzy, fast-paced, cosmopolitan lives. Um, they are educated, they driven. Um, and, 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 and for me, what's intentional about that is that I do feel that a lot of even the post-colonial uh, narratives that we're telling now still um, take us back to our suffering in our past. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's a place for that. But I think it's very important that we locate um, the other side of who we are as Africans, that we not kind of stuck in this continuum of depression and sadness and mayhem and poverty that we can barely uh, resurface from. That there's other that, that that there is this under this other world that's being lived, and I think it's important that we bring it to light because, um, you know, we're not beholden to anyone to always reflect on that that which is wrong with our societies. I think we owe it to ourselves and to you know future generations to reflect um, the things that are working, um, even if they are said within the context of a crime <laughs> novel, you know. But and I think that's also something that crime allows you to do that you can reflect on different elements of social economic aspects of um, your your setting without um, you know trying to kind of make it a rosy picture that is unrealistic. I mean, South Africa 
it does have a serious crime problem, and which is why probably I'm drawn to even uh, uh, um, the crime genre. But at the same time, there are a lot of things that are happening um, that we can be optimistic about, um, not only as South Africans, but as Africans in general. That is really um, fantastic. Uh, I guess there's only one person left in this, which is uh, you, Mukuka, and, and your work that you're doing, which involves elements of, of really bleak um, history, but are you also an optimist or maybe you're the one Afro-pessimist in this group? Absolutely uh, um, optimistic. Uh, I wouldn't call myself an Afro-pessimist at all. Um, I, I, I feel, as, as, as I, I believe Femi said, I, I, I want to tell a good story and, and, and tell a good contemporary story that, that people identify with, there's some humor in parts and uh, light moments in others, and uh, I, I just want to tell uh, a story that that is that feels believable. Uh, and for me, um, if when I intertwine some history in there and have a reader really not being able to discern between fact and fiction, I then I've done my job. And and so I'm I'm absolutely uh, optimistic and optimist. And so. There we have it. We're almost out of time now. We've been talking about Five Nights Before the Summit by Mokoka Chipanta, Critical But Stable, Angela Makolwa, and Femi Kayode's debut, Light Seekers. These are some excellent, excellent novels, whether you're looking to get into the crime genre as a reader or you are learning your craft and you want to learn how to be a crime writer, I highly recommend these novels because they are so diverse and they show you all the different possibilities that exist within um, the particular genre. So thank you so much, guys, for, for being here. I would like to thank the guys at um, RK Festival for hosting and, and, and arranging this. And, and thank you, readers, for tuning in. And most of all, thank you, authors, for turning up to this event. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Let me introduce a new way we change the rules A new app that you can use Wanna change your life then choose Save money and invest Pay bills when you decide Safe and secure for you when you need a loan request it. One bank for you One bank for me So chill and enjoy the ride Stop the current account on it One bank One bank by Sterling Open a current account and start transacting.